Okay, now we're looking at instrumental analysis in modern analytical chemistry. So these days, not much chemical analysis is done using the old fashioned methods of titration and gravimetric analysis, etc. Almost all of it's done using high tech equipment and automated processes. And we're looking now at a few of those different techniques. The first one that we'll be doing is ultraviolet visible spectroscopy, UV vis, and going through the basic principles that this technique uses. <coughs> so the basic technique is by measuring how much light gets absorbed by the solution. Now if you've got you know just intuitively that the, um, the intensity of the colour of a solution gives you a good indication of how concentrated it is. So here going from left to right we've got decreasing concentrations of copper sulphate solution. Now when we think about it, the clear solution on the right, all of the light is being transmitted through that, none of it's being absorbed by the water. As we move back towards the left, more and more light gets absorbed until the one on the far left, almost all of the light that hits that solution gets absorbed and virtually none of it gets transmitted through to our eyes. And that's the basic principle of these techniques. Coloured solutions absorb light in proportion to their concentration. Now all this has been analysed mathematically. Um, we don't have to do too much of that, just we just apply a simple graphing technique to work it out. Now let's just think about that difference between absorbed light and transmitted light. Think about a fairly simple example, like when white light strikes a green leaf. The sunlight that hits the green leaf contains all of the colours of the rainbow. So from red to violet, all of that light is hitting the leaf. Now, when that light hits the leaf, most of the colours get absorbed. So the red, the blue, the violet, all gets absorbed by the leaf. And it's only the wavelengths that aren't absorbed, that bounce off that leaf, that go on to hit our eyes, that's what we see. So we see the wavelengths, the yellow and the green, that isn't absorbed by the leaf. We see the reflected light. So effectively, it's the colours at either extreme, either end of the spectrum, are absorbed, and the transmitted light is what's left over. So it's the red and the violet, those wavelengths are the wavelengths that um, leaves use in photosynthesis that they turn into chemical energy that we all depend on. And uh, we see in another, well it's a fairly simple animation of a copper sulphate solution, a blue liquid. Now again when the white light hits that liquid, comes in from the left there, then all of the colours enter the solution. Now, most of them, again, both ends of the spectrum, in particular the violet and then red, yellow, orange, all of that gets absorbed pretty strongly. It's only the colours in between, around about the blue part of the spectrum, they're the only wavelengths that aren't absorbed, that gets transmitted, that hit our eyes, that we see. Now, just remember with this, um, our perception of colour is as much a psychological process as a physiological process. So the exact wavelengths that get absorbed and transmitted don't correspond perfectly to um, what we see, but it gives the overall um, process by which it works pretty accurately. 
So, going back to that um, chlorophyll example, there are two molecules in chlorophyll which absorb strongly. Um, one absorbs strongly in the blue part of the spectrum, the other absorbs strongly in the red part of the spectrum. So what we see is focused on what's in the middle and that centres on the green part of the spectrum. In terms of complementary colours, we see the complementary colours. So, if the um, if the solution absorbs green, we see it as red. If the solution absorbs violet, we see it as yellow. If the solution absorbs red, whoops, we see it as green, etc. So. We're not interested in the transmitted light. We're not interested in the light of the colour that we actually see because that's not being absorbed by the solution. It's the absorbed light that's going to be <coughs> dependent on the concentration. So the higher the concentration, the more, absor more light will be absorbed. So it's those absorbed wavelengths that we're interested in. So hopefully you've worked all that out and um, have, a, have a go at answering those questions. Okay, copper sulfate appeared blue because blue light is transmitted. That means the other wavelengths are absorbed. Indeed, the red light is what's absorbed by the copper sulfate. So it's the red light which gives us the ability to work out the concentration of the copper sulfate. we would use to uh, measure copper sulfate um, for chlorophyll. To work out the best wavelengths to use, we use this absorption spectrum, which is a measurement of the amount of light absorbed at each wavelength. And it's those peaks, we would use one of those peaks to work out the concentration of chlorophyll. So it's either going to be that violet end, blue violet end, or it's either for that red end. So one of those two wavelengths, 434, 660 or so. So turning that into a useful technique involves a bit of tricky instrumentation, but the basic principles are fairly straightforward. You've got a light source at this end designed to produce a narrow beam of a specific wavelength, just one pure colour. So a light source obviously produces a range of wavelengths, then by narrowing it down using a slit and then using a prism structure, you can, you can isolate a particular wavelength that's then shone through the sample. Example in a in a vessel, you've got to choose. You've got to have um, the samples in cells that aren't going to absorb any light themselves, of course. Then, so the sample absorbs some light. The rest of the light goes on and hit the detector, and so you're actually measuring transmitted light, and then that gets converted into absorbed light. This fairly ancient diagram's got a a needle as a recorder, of course everything's computerised these days, you'll get digital readouts. So anything which we can turn into a coloured solution, we can measure the concentration of. 
So basically it's got to be something coloured and it's got to be able to be made into a solution. And there's a huge range of different analyses that can be done. UVB is, is so widely used in industrial chemistry and in um, medical analysis. So metal ions are the sorts of really simple things that we can do. Whole lots of organic compounds can be used either by measuring their absorbance in the UV range or by reacting them with something to turn them into a coloured solution. Dyes obviously and then lots of things in food can be analysed as well. Now when we use it, what we need to be most familiar with is this process of how do we actually use the machine to give us a concentration. Well, the first thing we need to do is to have some way of converting between an absorbance and a concentration. And the way we do that is to measure the absorbance of standard solutions. Measure the absorbance of solutions of known concentration. Which is what a standard solution is, of course. So we get a whole series of standard solutions. So 0.1 molar, 0.2 molar, 0.3 molar, 0.4 molar, whatever, just a series of different solutions of increasing concentration. And we put them in the UVVs machine and we measure the absorbance of each of them. From that, we can prepare a calibration graph, which has got concentration along the x-axis and absorbance up the y-axis. So we plot each of those absorbances and hopefully we get a straight line. Now we can use that calibration graph then to work out the concentration of an unknown solution. All we need to do is measure the absorbance of that unknown solution and then use the calibration graph to read off the concentration. So, an example. We're measuring the concentration of a potassium permanganate solution, which is an intensely violet coloured solution, very suitable for UV vis. So what are we going to do? We're going to prepare ourselves a series of standard solutions. Measure their concentrations and then measure the concentration of our unknown solution. And we get results looking like this. So we've got the concentrations of our standard solutions. These are the standard solutions, the ones that we know the concentration of. So going up from zero, right up to 3.5 grams per litre. All those standard solutions we measure the absorbance of and they're the absorbances. Then after we've done that, we can then measure the absorbance of our unknown solution and we we'll see it's somewhere in the range. You can see it's 0.62, which sort of fits in there. So you can see it's going to be somewhere between 2 and 2.5 grams per litre but we'll be able to work that out more accurately by drawing our graph. So that's the next thing we need to do. We take the standard solutions, the ones we know the concentration of, and we plot them on the graph. We're going to have concentrations along the x-axis, so going from 0 to 3.5 along the x-axis, and then the absorbances, 0 to 1 up the y-axis. Now, Mathematically, this data should give us a linear model. So we should be able to uh, produce a straight line of best fit. If we see the, um, if we see it, the lines curving, then there might be some problems with our um, solutions. We'll need to rethink our analysis. So have a go at drawing this graph. It's, these are a fairly important skills getting these graphs right. So just plot each of those points. So concentration zero, absorbent zero. In fact, I might start doing a little bit of it here. Concentration zero, absorbent zero. Concentration 0.5, absorbent 0.13. Concentration 
Revelation 1 is Romans 1.26. 1.5 is point three nine. Two is point five two. Two point five is point six five. Point seven eight. And point nine one. Hopefully you can see those dots there. And the next thing to do is to draw a line of best fit. So with that ruler, which unfortunately we don't have in the library here, we need to get our line of best fit. So we can always improvise when we don't have a ruler. And we see it. See, this is really nice data. All of the points are pretty much on the line. So that's a calibration graph. Now, once we've got our calibration graph, we can use that graph to work out the concentration of our unknown. So 0.62, so read off 0.62 on the absorbance, come across the graph, read off down on the x-axis. Now there might be a slightly neater animated version here, I'll just, oh look at that, perfect. Then the concentration of the unknown solution, so read across from point 8.62 to where it hits the graph, then read off down on the x-axis and we see our concentration is 2.4 grams per litre. So that's the basic process of um, UVVs spectrophotometry. Pretty straightforward. Just need to get your graph work happening there. So have a go at that question, pause the video, have a go at the question, and then once you've done it, come back and check your answer. Okay, hopefully you get the concentration of 0 0.013. I don't have any animated solutions on this. So, with concentration 0 up to 0.2 going along your x-axis, then the absorbance is going up to, probably up to 6 on the y-axis. You're just gonna, I'll do a very quick sketch of what it's going to look like if I can come on here. So your concentrations going up to 0 0.02. The absorbance is going up to 6. of those, so 0 0.05, 7, 4.2, 5.6, given them rule, rule line of best fit, then read 
feed off the concentration of the unknown, the absorbance of the unknown is 3.6. So we don't use that one, of course, in constructing a calibration graph. We only use that right at the end to work out our concentration of unknown. So 3.6, according to my pretty bodgy graph. Turn it off down here and, oh, it's actually not that too far. I've got that a little bit wider, but you can see it's fairly close to 0 0.013. That's the process. Now, the only time this gets more complicated is um, when we get dilutions involved. So sometimes the solution is too concentrated to give a clear absorbance. This is absorbing all the light. So if that happens, then we need to do a dilution. So in this case, we've taken 10 mils and we've diluted it to 50 mils. So we've got a dilution factor of five happening here. So we've got our calibration graph. Thankfully, someone's done the work for us and prepared our calibration graph. So we can take the absorbance of our unknown solution, our diluted solution, read that off. And when we do so, We'll get 13.5. So what was the absorbance we were reading off? It's 0 0.989. 0 0.989, 0 0.91, 989 is going to be there. If we rule our line across, we're going to hit there. Axis and we're going to hit there, which is indeed 13.5 parts per million. Uh, I don't, again, I don't have a ruler here, so we would rule that across, rule that down. So that's the diluted solution. Now, from the question, we can see that we did a dilution to prepare that. So what was the dilution? Well, we know the two volumes. 10 mils is the initial volume. 50 mils was the final volume. So that gives us a dilution factor of five. So the original concentration must have been five times higher. 67.5 parts per million. Okay, next we need to turn that into a molarity. Now you'll all recall that. Of course, from our work on units of concentration, we're turning parts per million into moles per litre. Now parts per million, when we're talking about solutions, we usually mean milligrams per litre. So we turn milligrams per litre into moles per litre. So it basically means milligrams has to be turned into moles. So milligrams to grams, divide by 1,000. Grams to moles by dividing by the molar mass. The iron solution, so it's 55.8. And that gives us our molarity. So, similarly, 
how to graph this question. And pause the video, have a go at the question, and then come back and check the answer. Okay, so we've got our diluted solution, so that absorbent of 0.18. We read across that, rule down here, and we get 0.23. So 0.18 across the graph, reads off down here, midway between 0.0, .0 0.020, 0.025. What was the concentration of the original solution? What was our dilution? Our dilution was 20 mils to 250 mils. So 250 over 20 gives us a dilution factor of 12.5. The initial solution must have been 12.5 times the diluted solution, which gives us 0.2. 288 molar. This time we're going to turn that back into grams per litre. So 0.288 moles per litre into grams per litre. Basically it means moles into grams. We simply multiply it by the MR. The MR of copper, molar mass of copper. gives us that concentration in grams per litre. Okay, that is the vis.